Okay, let's give the Lord praise this morning. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, you guys. You're such, don't they do a great job? Amen. Amen. We appreciate it. Amen. 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 Well, again, it's my honor and privilege this morning. You know, I love Brother Joe, and we've been going to, we've had several of our youth camps where he, we always like to pick his camp. Amen. Because the one he's going to be speaking at, there's usually four different speakers. And we, we just love him so much. And, uh, and uh, have you ever heard Brother Joe before? Okay, some of, some of you haven't, so you're going to be blessed this morning, not because of who he is, but he simply just lets God flow through him, and I appreciate that so much. Will you welcome him as he comes this morning? Amen. What a great honor to be here. Good morning, beloved. How's everybody? It's good to see you. It's very good to see you, and congratulations on your church. I, I think this was fantastic. I just feel God on it and in it, and it's a wonderful a blessing to have all this land right here on this main highway. Thank the Lord. Thank God. He's doing stuff. I love you, Pastor, and his wife, and family. When it comes up, Pastor, appreciation. I don't know if that was that this month or last month, but make sure you do something extra because he is a camp counselor. Were you a counselor last year? Yes. He, and then we're, we're old people. <laughs> yeah, and we're old. <laughs> you know? And, we, and, and I, all I got is preach and have a four-hour service. He's got to go through the service and then spend all day in the sun. I don't know how he does it. I saw him and I was, I was mesmerized and hypnotized. <laughs> wow, it's really great to be with you. Bring folks tonight. Tonight is like uh, Billy Graham and Ray Romano, you know, kind of got together and had a combination of uh, it's it's, it's going to be 30 to 45 minutes of family-friendly comedy, goofy, self-deprecating stuff, talking about my family, me, the church, and all that kind of stuff. And then I'm going to share my testimony, which has comedy in it. And it's going to be fun and relaxing and all of that. And then, uh, and then we're going to give an opportunity in a very non-threatening way for people to receive the gift of Jesus. And they'll respond. And it's not going to be about brow-beating or anything like that. Sometimes I do... Comedy clinics, an evening of healing and humor. Bring somebody that needs a miracle or a laugh or needs both. And that's like Benny Hinn and Jerry Seinfeld get together. I mean, that's a, kind of a real thing. You, your pastor asked a young man to speak, and it reminded me of something Seinfeld said one time. You know the number one fear? This is true. The number one fear in America is public speaking. That's why your pastor just asked this, this young man, hey, you want to do something that everybody's afraid of? <laughs> The number one fear in America is public speaking. And number two is death. So Seinfeld said, people would rather be in the box than given the eulogy on the other side of it. I want you to uh, turn in your Bible to 2 Samuel 23. I do have something to tell you today. This is, i me give you an insider trading here a little bit on how the sausage is made in, in terms of evangelism. God over years of pastoring and youth ministry and 10 years now, going on my 11th year of full-time road work, we have a block of revelations. Uh, people say you know, evangelists have four sermons and they preach it all over the country. We, we have a blocks of things that God has given to us over the years. And so I don't come with preconceived ideas. I woke up this morning and had my devotion, four chapters from uh, different four different books in the the New King James is what I'm reading. Just picked it up reading this year. And the next year, through the next year. Joshua chapter 9, Joshua has a group of people come to him and they, and they swindled him. And they, they tricked him. And the Bible said, and Joshua did not consult the Lord. He did not, they did not consult the Lord before they made this treaty. And so I just said in the hotel today, Lord, I know you want to say something specific to this great church river of life in Alexander City, Alabama. And I ask you to show me, and before I can put a sentence on him, he showed me what I'm about to preach to you tonight, this morning. And, and I'm blaming it on him. But I, you know, sometimes the Lord will talk to you. I don't want to be mystical. Uh, he probably talks to us all the time like an Aflac. Like, Aflac, Aflac, you know, probably talk to us all the time, and I don't want to hear it all the time. But I was listening in that hotel. Lord, I have to give an account to you for this time. What do you want to say? He showed it to me, and then I thought I heard him say, that was easy, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, all right. Just ask. 
And we're on an altar service in a few moments, and some of you will bring negative stuff, and some of you will bring positive stuff. I'll tell you what that means as we go along. Some of you come to this altar and bring negative stuff, and some bring positive stuff. This past summer in Alabama, West Florida, and Arkansas, we saw phenomenal miracles. I wish I could put a picture. I have a picture of a girl who had a skin disorder that was like fish scales out of water. She, she was always bleeding. It was always cracked. She was always ashamed to wear shorts in public or expose her arms. And it was uh, constant lotion, all that stuff. She came to, as an atheist, and on Tuesday night, she didn't... She didn't uh, keep her atheism she accepted Jesus and on Thursday night she said would you heal me of this and uh, and that skin turned as smooth as a baby's body I have a picture of half of her leg the last little bit of it was going off of her body and I sat there and, and watched if you were minded pastor I'll show you that picture at lunch and it just came off of her leg I think that things like that happen oftentimes just cause we give God an opportunity just because we ask Him. And I'm going to ask you to give God an opportunity at the end of this service. Now, when I preach this, you're going to think that I'm doing this for ulterior motives. I didn't know pastor was going to take it off. In fact, I didn't know if I was going to get paid. I mean, I just don't make any demands. I just come. I don't know if honorarium or anything like that. I'm not preaching this to get a bigger offering. I'm not preaching this because it's the Word of the Lord. And also, I didn't know you were doing baptism, which I think is... Kind of cool, because uh, we just saw it poured out right here, over for you. Uh, so like Second Samuel chapter 23, let me pray. Set up the scriptures for just a moment with a little uh, illustration, then I'll read a good portion of this passage and we're off. God, I've got about 35 minutes or so to preach a word that you have placed in my heart for this moment, for this morning, for this people. Not many of us should presume to be te teachers because there's a stricter judgment or condemnation. Hebrews 13, 17 says that we should submit to our authorities and to leaders because they have to give an account for souls. And so I know I give an account for this. And I, I just am confident in you to help me preach and prophesy and give us every spiritual gift that we need. Earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. We earnestly desire the gift of prophecy preach to tell what you would say if you were standing up here today and also we would earnestly desire the gift of healing or faith or miracles or word of knowledge discernment and get whatever it is that we need we're asking you for that Lord. now i pray that you'll fill me with these four things Lord, as i preach fill me with the holy spirit fill me with the love of jesus christ for you and for your people fill me with the word of the lord and fill me with faith in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. They came to you and said, We're going to give you an opportunity. You can go to a fairly dangerous Muslim country and work for one year. You're not very interested. Wait, wait, wait. If you go do this, we're going to give you five years of pay for one year of work. And suddenly you become more interested. Start asking questions. When you feel settled about it, you decide, Well, I'm going to do that. They've got good security. I'm going to do that. You get to uh, that Muslim speaking. That Islamic country, that Muslim country, Arabic-speaking people. And you go and you find that your supervisor on the 40th floor is a, not only in America. They're from sweet home Alabama. And beyond that, they like the same football team you like. Roll Tide War Eagle. How about those Tro Troy or Trojans out there? <laughs> they like the same team you like. You're like, we're going to make it for a year. After about three months, you hear your supervisor she says this. Ah, oh, this is a terrible week. I, I wish I had a case of Dr. Peppers. I wish I had a case of Dr. Peppers. Or whatever your favorite, insert your favorite drink. Some people are Pepsi, some people are Coke. Mountain Dew, whatever your thing is, cheer wine, sun drop, whatever. Oh, I wish I had a case of Dr. Peppers. But you found, you found out a guy that knows a guy that knows another guy. And you get yourself an idea on a Friday. You go tripping down a, an alleyway with a couple of your buddies. You find where there's a guy with a case after case of Dr. Pepper. They don't even know what they got. They think it's furniture polish. They don't even know what they got in there. You buy a case or two. <laughs> Monday morning with your chest pushed out, your buttons about to pop, you walk into your supervisor and you lay that case of Dr. Pepper on her desk and say, I know you had a bad week last week, but I, we thought we might try to cheer you up today. 
She don't say a word. She takes that case of Dr. Pepper and she goes straight over to the window, puts it under her arm, opens the window in because those windows are a little weird. There's nothing but desert below. And one after another, she takes every one of those cans and flings it 40, 40 stories into the dirt. How would that make you feel? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look. 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23 says... And three of the thirty men went down and came about harvest time to David at the cave of Adullam, when a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephim. And David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. And David said long, Lord, somebody will give me water and drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. Then the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water out of the well at Bethlehem that was by the gate and they carried and brought it to David but he would not drink it he poured it out to the Lord he would not drink it he said far be it from me O Lord that I should do this shall I drink the blood of the men who win at the risk of their own lives therefore he would not drink it these are the three things that, these are these things the three mighty men did now let me give you a little backdrop. This is the uh, credits in the book of 2 Samuel. This is the credits. This is not chronological. This is the videography, musical score, de design, set design, all that stuff of David's life. So at the end of his life here, and the credits are rolling, it talks about some of the incidents of his life. And one of them was this cave incident. I've always been fascinated by it. I've always, I've always been a little bit offended by it, to be honest with you. I started thinking about it not too long ago. Now, you've got to keep in mind, if you read the first of, the, of this uh, passage up around verse 8, he, he is, he's hanging out with some bad dudes. The, it, it says up in this chapter, one guy that he's hanging out with killed 800 people with his own hands. Tom Cruise ain't got nothing on that cat, baby. I'm, that guy's bad. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to take his parking space at Walmart, if you know what I'm saying. <coughs> These are the kind of people that are in a cave. But David, David is backed up in a cave because of Saul's insanity. And he's hiding in a cave with all these kinds of people. One guy killed 300 people. Benaiah Abishai and another unnamed bad dude. They, they did such unbelievable things. One of them killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. One of them killed an Egyptian with a stick. One of them killed 300. One of them killed so many people that his hand froze to the sword. They're like, hey, let, loosen up, loosen up, loosen up, loosen up. I had to peel it off of them. These are the people you don't want to make mad. I will say this. Who we are sort of attracts people like us to us. So David was a warrior, and the warriors were attracted to David. And in his cave, he was not yet the king. He was hiding in a cave. Why was he hiding in a cave? Because caves are great places in the Middle East to hide. Ask Osama bin Laden's family. We thought he was in a cave in Pakistan. We couldn't even get him with a, with a buster, bunker buster bomb. We found him in a Dollar General in Pakistan or somewhere like that. Maybe a Hardee's or something. But we thought he was in a cave. Because caves are great places to hide. There he is. In the, it's about this time of the year. It's in the harvest season. It's hot. And then he's sweating with all these stinky dudes in there. You imagine what a guy smelled like that just killed 800 people? He needs some, he needs some air to extra dry or something. He's stinky. And it doesn't say that David doesn't have any water in there. He probably had water. Maybe the camels and the mules were drinking from the water. And so the water had straw and camel spit and all that in it. But he said longingly, Oh, that I have water to drink from the well by the gate in Jerusalem. These three bad dudes, I, Abishai, you say the other unnamed bad dude, they look at each other, you thinking what I'm thinking? Yes, I am. Now, what are you thinking? I'm thinking, getting me an idea right now. I think you, I'm getting an I'm getting an idea. Why don't we just trip off and go to the Philistines and get some water? Now, keep in mind the Philistines are not like, you know, the opposing football team. I learned at Columbus State University down in Columbus, Georgia, that the Philistines and the Assyrians, these are these are wicked people. I mean, the, the Assyrians were 
would, would do, would just throw pregnant women off a cliff. I mean, that's the kind of people that are coming in and invading and pushing David into a cave because of their evil and Saul's insanity, his boss's insanity. So they go tripping off to get that, that water. I want to know how they get it. When I get to heaven, I'm, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. One of them is, can I see Benaiah, Abishai, and the other unnamed bad dude? I want to find out how they went in and got it. I want to know, did they do it real stealthy-like? Sometimes, sometimes when I'm out in public with my, my kids, even in the age of 20, and they're all adults, I'll hide behind a stop sign. That don't never work. <laughs> and they, they see parts of me protruding through the stop sign. I want to know, did they come in stealthy, stealthy-like, sneaky? Did they come in like ninjas? <laughs> I mean, they had to have some courage. Three dudes against a Philistine garrison camped down there. I think they might have come in with a swagger. What's up? Yeah, I killed 800 people. I killed your cousin, too. He's ugly. You're ugly, too. I kill you. Get him out of here. I want to get this water. I don't know how they did it. But they got this water. And they brought it. And they brought it today. They brought this water today. <coughs> <laughs> one guy killed two lion-like men with his own hands. What's that? I don't even know what that is. I don't even know what that means. Men look like lions. So they came in and said, David, we know you're having a bad day. Some uh, commentators say that it was just a public spirited wish. David was like, oh, I wish we could drive those people out and go back, go back home. But that's not how these three men interpreted it at all. David, we knew you were having a bad day, so we, we broke through the enemy lines. We went to the well by the gate in Jerusalem, and we got you some plain, clean, no camel spit, no straw water, pure water from that well. And David went to the 40th floor, opened the window, and chunked the Dr. Pepper cans to the desert. I've always been offended by that. Until I started really thinking it through. Why did he do it? Now, if you've got a three-man army, they kill a thousand people between the three of them, you really don't want to tick those guys off. You don't, you want to have good employee-employer relations with those boys. The Bible doesn't say they were mad at all. In fact, I bet they kind of liked it. And that's the reason they're in the cave with David anyway, because they know that's the kind of character and caliber of a man that he is. So I'm coming up with some theories here. And let me just float them out here to you for a moment. Why did David pour out the water that they risked their lives to get from the well by the gate in Jerusalem? I've got some theories. One theory is they poured out, he was pouring out his wrong words. He was pouring out his wrong words. See, he didn't think anybody was listening to him. Oh, that I had water to drink from the well by the gate in Jerusalem. But People heard it. See, they hear our words too. You don't know that grandkid is listening to grandma and grandpa. You think he's listening to that iPad, but he's listening to everything you say. He's, that people are hearing our words. I love the scripture. It says like, a, like an apple of gold in a setting of silver is a well-timed word, an apt reply. I've got some on the shelves of my brain. My grandfather, who was angry that I left my pre-law major at Columbus State University to become a preacher, he was mad. He said, we need lawyers in this family back. <laughs> <laughs> but he thought about it for a week, and he said to me, I've been thinking about it, and I know if you're going to be a preacher, you're going to be a great one because you have a winning way with people. That was spoken to 35 years ago. And I put that apple of gold in the setting of silver. The, the reverse is true. Out of the same mouth come blessing and cursing. These things ought not to be. People are listening to those things. And every word speaking and spoken in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. Even in the Oval Office, they get shouted from the rooftops. Maybe he's pointing out his wrong words. Realized what a dumb thing he had done to say that. How people were listening to. Maybe, 
Maybe he's pouring out his wrong values. Maybe that's what he was pouring out, negatively speaking. Because everybody in that cave had to be paying attention. Hey, come here, come here, come here. They're going to give David some water from the well. And they're all on pins and needles. How's he going to respond? Is he going to value that water? If it was me, I'm telling you, I'd say, well, since you went to all the trouble, I'll just take a sip. Is he going to value the blood of that three men, three man army, or is he going to value the water for his own desires? They're all up in the knees. On 12, 12, 11, December 12, 2011, they had an article in the magazine, I think it was Charisma Magazine. Ten characteristics of a ministry diva. Always has to fly in a private jet, has an armor bearer to carry his Bible and man purse and all of his stuff, sits on the front row or on the platform even if he's not speaking. He's always got his picture the biggest thing in the advertising. He always says his books are bestsellers even if they ain't. Is David going to be a ministry diva? Or is he going to recognize correct values? If there's ever a day in America where we need to cling to what is valuable it is today. Amen. Maybe he's pouring out his wrong passion. Maybe he's pouring out his wrong passion. If you have an emergency, they say you can only last 36 hours in inclement weather like a blizzard without shelter, 36 hours tops. You can last 21 days without food. You can only last three days without water. What's wrong with water? What's wrong with water? Well, our bodies are made up between 60 and 75 percent water. I've got a lot of water. I mean, I'm made up of a lot of water. What's wrong with we've got to have water to live? There's nothing wrong with water except when the water is wrong. Like the lady who says, Pastor, pray for me. I just want my husband. He can't spell Jesus. I just want a man who can. I just want a man who will hold my hand and pray in Jesus' name like some of the men at the church I attend. Oh, pray for me. The Lord may be speaking to me. There's nothing wrong with wanting a man to pray with you and be a, a man of God except when it is wrong. That's what I'm seeing in the cave here. Some, some men have their wives yelling at the door. Don't have to pick up the knife, in the milk. The curls in their hair, if they still do that, I don't know. <laughs> and you've got to take out the trash. Gets to work. That young sister greets him with a perfectly mixtured cup of coffee. She's perfectly made up, excited and respectful, and says, Hello, Bill, are you losing weight? I don't see how you accomplish all the work you do. You do the work of three men. Bill sits in the chair and squeaks back, puts his feet on the desk and says, about time somebody recognized around here, you know, who I am. There's nothing wrong with wanting a wife that will respect you and honor you and love you except when it is wrong. <coughs> David was thirsty. Passion is a powerful thing. I've heard missionaries drone on and on. I remember one time droning, a missionary droned on and on. First, I only pastored one church for three years. First meeting I ever had was not a prayer meeting, a business meeting, a board meeting. It was a life for the lost meeting. And he was, <coughs> and in consolation rate in the Appalachian Mountains is 14 points But then a gear switched to that dude. And he put down his notes and began to share his horror about people behind bars. And I reached for my checkbook straight away because passion is a powerful thing. It's also a terrible thing. So he's pouring out his wrong passion. One more negative before we get to a couple of positives. Maybe David, it's just a theory, it's just a theory, just using some inductive reasoning. Maybe David was pouring out in that cave, his wrong nostalgia. <laughs> oh, did I have water to drink from the well by the gate that's in Jerusalem? I remember the good old days. Used to come off the field with chasing away the lions and the 
bears and sit down sweaty and draw up that cool water from the well. This is why I know I'm getting old, Pastor. I'm starting to long for the good old days. I catch myself saying things I used to make fun of. Why can't they just listen to the gators? Well, I can't. What's wrong with the gators? Rock and roll, rock and roll. Get off my yard. Long for the good old days. Remember the revivals we used to have in the seventies and eighties? They'd last four or five weeks. What? Well, they didn't have cable back then, but still they had four or five weeks. <laughs> we can't have a can't have a Sunday night service. Can't have revivals. I just did a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday revival. Came from there to here. Twenty people accepted Jesus. I'm longing for the good old days. I, I I caught myself the other day. And if you're wearing this and this offends you. Send me an email. Make it ugly. MichaelWalter.com. Make it ugly. <laughs> I was in this very state about 10 years ago when those skinny jean things started getting real old fashioned. I'm an old fat guy and I looked at a guy and I said, hey man, I'm going to give you some of my offering tonight. He said, why would you do that, mate? I said, I, I met you last year. You're from Wetumpka, Alabama. Why are you talking like that? Oh, I live in Australia. I asked his pastor. Uh, he spent a week there at a conference. He came back talking like that. We can't get off of it. I'm going to give you some offer. Why you want to do that, man? Because you ain't got to your sister's britches up here on stage playing that guitar. I'll have you know it costs $190. I hope you got the receipts. You can get a lot of Wranglers for that, man. You can get a lot of Wranglers for that. Uh, and where I'm from, too, it, 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 these cool haircuts where they shave one side of the head. Looks like the barber got diarrhea and left the rest of it <laughs> flopping like this. Just shave it or grow it, man. Make up your mind. I can say that because I ain't got enough hair to make it style anyways. What my point is, long if it ain't good old days. Oh, I wish we had that storefront back. Remember how good it was over there? Had so much room. So much more convenient to the house song and for those good old days. But like they said in the movie, what if this right now is the good old day? What if we're living in the good old days? That water, that water, that well is inaccessible, David. Forget about that well. Forgetting those things which are behind, let's press on to the next well that God has for you. Now here, is the most theologically, hermeneutically, and exegetically correct interpretation of this passage. David, you're backed up against the wall of a cave, and you're a man after God's own heart, and David is. And you got nothing to give to God. You got nothing. You're in here with a bunch of sweaty, smelly guys that have blood underneath their fingernails and you got nothing to give to God. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes water. David was pouring out that water as an offering. He wasn't pouring it out before the Lord like God was in the corner of the universe looking over His shoulder, checking on us from time to time. He was pouring out that water like Jesus was in the cave standing there with him. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, 2 Kings, and Ezra talk about the drink offering. He was giving this to God. And that is exactly what he expects of each of us. Whatever we've got, no matter if it's just two mites, just two mites. Whatever we've got, if it's an alabaster jar worth one year, that he has access to what we have and we'll give it to him. He was given an offering to the Lord. I love to give offerings. But I'm going to tell you what, it, what else he was doing. He was pouring it out for a better return. He was pouring it out for a better. He had a decision to make. You know what I can do right now? I can drink this water and it's going to satisfy my thirst today. It won't do nothing for me tomorrow. But it'll satisfy me today and it's going to be good. And I don't want to offend these guys. Wait a minute. 
or I can give this to God, the God who might just give me the well that that water came from, mm -hmm. and then all the wells in the land. I want to ask something. I, I've not asked Pastor for one thing except the bottle of room temperature water. I'm going to ask for the only other thing. I haven't advertised my books and all that stuff. I'm going to ask somebody here to give me five dollars that you'll never see again. I don't want ten. I don't want a hundred. I don't want to take a check, a credit card. I can do that at the table, but I'm just asking you to give me five. Anybody willing to do that? Come right up here and hand it to me. You'll never see it again. Anybody willing to do that? Borrow money from your friend if you have to. Anybody got a five dollar bill? Anybody got a five dollar bill? This is one thing I've learned while they're looking for five dollars. Pastor, why'd you bring this guy in? Sheepskate. And he, okay, stand up. All right. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank. Give him a hand. He's willing. He, no, 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 no. Just, uh, just one. Just one. Thought he might hit me. <laughs> he is an Auburn fan, and I'm an Alabama fan. But uh, my wife's an Auburn fan. If that counts, don't hit me. All right. Well, yeah, we hadn't planned this beforehand, obviously, by the, the amount of time it took you to to get up here. All right. Keep your hand just like that until I tell you to let go. Now, I've learned this. Whenever you give something to God, He does something. Okay? You can put your hand in just for a second. Say, no, no, just, just put your hand in so you don't get, don't get tired. Get ready because you might do that same thing again. Remember Solomon? He, he's the wisest man that ever lived. You know what put him on the map of wisdom? Two prostitutes. The Bible's rated R in places. This is one of the places that it's rated R for violence. 800 people dying? That's bloody. And then the other one is, uh, you know, uh, this other place. Lots of places that have uh, tough content. Two prostitutes had babies and they went to sleep. One of them fell asleep on the baby and killed the baby and she swept, switched the baby, swapped them out. So in the next morning, the other prostitute said, Good morning, baby. Oh, my baby's dead. My baby. And then she said, This ain't my baby. So they bring the living baby to Solomon. And Solomon says, Bring me a sword, we shall cut the living baby in twain. Each of you shall have half of it. And remember what the one prostitute said? Uh, good, that's good. But the, but the real, but the real mama, she says, no, she can have the baby. Now drop that five and keep your head just like that. You'll never see this money again. I don't know if you borrowed it. I'm going to get half a cup of coffee at Starbucks on the way around your shop. And I will never see that again. But there's something about, there's something about giving to the Lord. See, when we give in the offering to the tithe and the offering of the missionary comes by, we think that it's going into the dirt never to come back. But that's not the way it is. We found out with the lady with the baby, we found out with a kid who said, you can have my fish, you can have my loaves, that God, when we give, turns our hand over. And you remember, we don't buy a miracle, we can't. But we're not going to outgive God, outdo God, and He'll put something like a baby, something like 12 loaves back into our hands. Give this young man a hand. You believe that? Say amen. You give to God. We don't give something He'll turn our hand over, but we can't help it when He does because it's just a law of reciprocity. When you give of your service, of your life, of your time, He turns the hand over. I, I'm going to share a couple of stories here. That are true. This will tell you what kind of psychotic evangelist you have. One year, one year I decided that I was going to try an experiment. Have you ever heard anybody say, You can't outgive God? <laughs> That's how we say it in the South. You can't outgive God. How many of you ever heard that statement? You can't outgive God. One year I said, I'm going to try. I kept a file. Everything, everything that God gave me on the right side, I put down beyond what I earned that He gave me in the first place. Someone bought me a lunch, $10, bought me a shirt, bought me a book. Then everything I gave to God beyond the tithe that belongs to Him, life of the law, speed the MC, speed the light, I put on the left side. At the end of the year, God outgave me 2,137%. That ain't even fair, is it? Imagine a stock with that kind of return. I started getting irritated. Who does that? Weirdo people. I said, it's not fair, God, you're God. I was trying to outgive you. And one day I went to the mountains in Georgia to preach. I knew they gave me a hundred bucks every time. That's just what they gave the district director. And I said to God on the way to the mountains, you're going to win the war. It's not fair, you're God. But I'm going to win the battle today. And I 
put $110 in the offering. <laughs> I love my team. I preached. They gave me my check. I went in the bathroom, took off my lapel mic. I couldn't stand it. I'm just going to make sure. They gave me an unauthorized raise of $120. <laughs> True story. Now he's up by 10 and I'm aggravated. The pastor said, Brother Joe, you want to eat somewhere fancy like Hardy's or Huddle House? Or we got a sloppy Joe dinner in the gym, raising money for the girls' softball uniforms. I said, how much is it? It's by donation. We got it. Don't you worry about it. I said, my name is Joe. This will work out perfectly. So when the pastor wasn't looking, I put $20 on that table at that softball uniform sloppy Joe, and I ate those nasty things. And when I was walking to the car afterwards, feeling good that I'm up by 10, somebody came out of the shadows. Scared me to death. <laughs> and they do what we do in the South. Preacher! You know, we don't say taxidermists, electricians, and preacher! <laughs> and, he, and he put something in my hand. Y'all know what that is, right? Pentecostal handshake. If you don't know what a Pentecostal handshake is, it's when somebody shakes your hand and puts something in there. And by virtue of the amount of the denomination of the money, you get more Pentecostal. <laughs> you know, <you're> looking, <laughs> that gets a five. You do, you know, if it's a hundred dollars, you can do a Jericho march. I, I just, I said, thank you. He said, preacher, I like what you said in there. And he gave me something in my hand. And I wouldn't look at it. I'm like, oh, I hope it's a hard Kleenex or a piece of notebook paper. I hope it's a $5 bill or a $1 bill. Or... I sat in the car for a long, long time. I sat in the car for a long time. Finally, I turned the dome light on and I opened my hand. And in my hand was a $100 bill. And I could have swore I heard a voice say, gotcha. <laughs> David eventually David eventually got got all the wells he was a king I don't know if he'd have gotten him if he'd have drank that water or not but I just know this you're not going to out give God out pour God out work God out do God he gave he gave God some water in a cave and God gave him all the water finally this see David understands thirst Psalm, the psalmist say over and over, and David stretched out his hands and declared, I, I long for you like, like in a dry and thirsty desert. He also understood prophecy. He understood that. In Psalm 110, it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool. Even Jesus told the Pharisees that David understood the coming Messiah better than those people who are looking at the Messiah. Is it possible that David poured out in that moment prophetically in the back of that cave towards one whose life would be poured out for us? Is it possible? Let's look at John. Let's look at what John says. John 4.10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have poured out and given you living water. John chapter 7, verse 38, Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. John chapter 19, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. And that water didn't just get into the desert floor and stay there from that blood and water. We are all assembled here today. Hallelujah. The Lord poured Himself out for us. I have in my phone is a pastor in Springville, Alabama, <clears throat> named McCarty. I don't know if you know him. He's right down the road from the camp. Got several campuses. Steve McCarty. Steve McCarty was a youth pastor at a church in Tennessee, and he resigned his church, and he came over that night to uh, to lead worship at the Tennessee youth camp. In the 90s, maybe, I don't know, maybe early 2000s. And on Thursday night at youth camp, I decided to preach about money, of all things. And I've never done that before or since. And then I, I, I referenced to the kids that this guy just had met him the day before, that he was becoming a missionary, resigned his youth pastor to become a missionary, goes to Rico. I had him come up, and, and I had the kids come and pray for him. And then I gave the service back to the district youth director. Terry Allen jumped up on a chair and said, we just heard what the man of God said. We're going to do what the man of God said. This man right here is going to be a missionary in the first offering. We're going to give 
him is from young people, and I watched $1,700 come from students onto that guy's feet. I remember the tears dripping off of his guitar. He attended the Thursday night service that we were at, Pastor, in the, that camp. He sat in the balcony. Tears dripping off of his guitar over that pile of cash. About 11 o'clock that night, in the overflow. That's why you got to give him combat pay. I mean, the services last forever. I was standing in the back. I was standing in the back. Swiping the sweat off my face, and I heard a girl scream. I see the hair on my youth pastor's arms. I walked over and said, I think I said, quote, let's alert the media. <clears throat> so that's a weird thing you just said right there. Everybody around her was bawling their eyes out. I said, why do you say something so squirrely about your youth pastor's hairy arms? One of the girls finally composed herself and said, she's blind. She has Coke bottle sized glasses and she broke them. She broke them on the field today and we had to lead her in by the arms and put her in her chair. And a while ago she opened up her eyes and saw the fine hair on her youth pastor's arm. Nobody even laid hands on her because I have a theory. You're not going to outgive God, outpour God, outdo God. You think, you think you make a great sacrifice if you if you give away something for the the VBS. God is going to get back, press down, shake it together, and run it over. That's what I believe. And David poured it out in that cave with a glimpse of Jesus. It's too bad he didn't remember it. Later on as a king looking over a roof at a woman bathing named Bathsheba. Too bad I didn't remember these lessons. But God is merciful and just and gracious. As the uh, altar music protocol, whatever it is here, as the musicians come back and the worship team comes back, whatever y'all do normally, I want to try to put a bow on this. Try to put a bow on this for you. This is a true story. It happened in 1958. Army Corps of Engineers sent a team to a brilliant mathematician and engineer from Auburn University. Knocked on his door and said, we have heard about you and we are uh, we wanted to come and contact you. We need you. We're going to put a man on the moon. We want you to help us. So I, I'd be honored. But we got a problem. What's the problem? We don't have money for a year. Our funding comes through in one year. That NASA wasn't even formed yet. It was the Army Corps of Engineers. We'll be back in a year. Can you get a job? He said, well, I can get a job. He thought he'd get a job on a farm. In Opelika, I thought he might get a job at his dad's grocery store, but he ended up getting a job teaching math to snot those kids in the inner city. And the Army Corps of Engineers came back with precision of an engineer, knocked on his door and said, we're here. We're here. You ready to put a man on the moon with us? He said, now I got a problem. What's your problem? I fell in love with these snot those kids. There's a picture back there, young man. Would you put that one picture up there? His name was Luther Reader. And that's about the time he was teaching. Auburn graduate. 24 years after that knock on that door, broke down, heartbroken, angry, sin-filled, perverse students sat in his class. And he put his arm around that student and showed him a better way. Invited him to church. It's like we're asking you to do with people tonight. And that student's got a microphone in his hand today in Alexander City, Alabama. Because Luther Reader poured out his life. Paul says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. 
I interviewed him. I, I preached his funeral last summer over in uh, Roxanne, Alabama. I remember saying, Lord, this will be the only funeral that I'll ever, ever preach that I can actually pray this prayer. God, thank you for this life. Because of this life, I'm going to go to heaven. I asked him in an interview before he died, I brought a camera crew, I said, did you ever regret the money? Now do the math. He's a math teacher. This is what the NASA would make over a career. This is what a public school teacher in the inner city would make over a year. See how that's different? Did you ever regret that? He said, shoot. I have more money than I ever know what to do with because you're not going to outgive God, out poor God. I'm asking somebody today to put your own self in the offering bucket. Not just to put money in an offering bucket. To put your own life in an offering bucket. Some of you say in this room, I know that I was created by God for more than this. I'm asking you to give your life to God. To pour yourself out as a drink offering. With this prophetic insight, you're not going to outgive Him, outdo Him. He said to Peter, Peter... You, you, blessed are those who give up houses and lands. They'll be rewarded 50 times over in this life. You're not going to outdo it. Somebody says, I'd give my heart to God, but I don't want Him to send me to Africa. I'm going to live my life and do it on my deathbed. That's a deception. You give your heart. You can't imagine the heart that He gives back to you and the opportunities. Bow your heads. Bow your heads, would you? If you're away from God, a hundred miles, a thousand miles, a half a mile, maybe 300 feet from God like Peter was in the boat in the book of John chapter 21, 300 feet from the shore, he was close to Jesus but didn't recognize Jesus. Wasn't having breakfast with Jesus quite yet. Maybe that's where you're at. I'm close. I'm close, but I'm not all the way in. Before I open this altar for people to pour things out to the Lord, symbolically in their hearts. i got to ask you, do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Do you know that? The Bible says these things are written that you might know, K-N-O-W, that you have eternal life. If you don't know it, i got good news. You can know it. You can know it. John 1, 12, to as many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God. 1 John 3, 1, how great the Father's love has lavished on us that we would be called the children of God. There's people up in Tennessee that are preaching the gospel today that have been arrested, convicted, tried, done their time for murder, and they got out and they're preaching the gospel. You ain't done nothing so bad in your fault life with your words or actions that you cannot be forgiven. The prophet said, come let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. The reason that water came off the cross when they hit him with a spear in his heart, that para, pericardium, whatever it is, that the heart and the blood and the water mixed together. That's a real thing. When that water spilled out and that blood spilled out, it spilled out for all of our sin. Anger, malice, wrath, discord, strife, enmity, prejudice, pride, hatred, unforgiveness, lovelessness, cheating, lying, stealing, adultery, sexual perversion. He poured His blood out for all of us and I feel Him in this room today wanting to love on you. Wanting you just to pour yourself out like a drink off and say, that's it. I'm not going to run another day and give my life to Jesus. People's heads are bowed and eyes are closed. When I count to three, if you're away from God, Joe, I'm away from God and I don't know that my name is registered in heaven. When I count to three, I'm just going to have you look up at me, make eye contact. I'm going to say, praise God. You put your head back down. Why, why is that important? It may not be important at all, but Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, we'll confess you before the Father. I got this revelation from the Lord. People are embarrassed to respond in moments like this. They don't get embarrassed about a lot. People take pictures in bathrooms by toilets and put them on the internet. They don't get embarrassed by a lot. What, what the embarrassment is, what if I look up at that preacher when he says the number three, and then Tuesday at Walmart, I lose my cool. That's what messes people up. Can you just forget about Tuesday for a minute? Like preacher said, shut the door. Shut the door, you and the Lord. Don't worry about Tuesday. Today is the day of salvation. Tuesday will have enough trouble of its own. 
Each day has enough trouble. You don't worry about Tuesday. God will help you with Tuesday. I'm asking you today, do you want to quit running and give your life to Jesus? One, Joe, I'm away from God and I don't like Him. I don't like Him. I, I don't want to be away from Him anymore. Two, Joe, I don't want to put my head on the pillow tonight like I did last night wondering if I'm absent from the body, will I be present with the Lord? I just want to know. And the way you know is that you just receive by faith Jesus Christ, not of works, lest any man should boast. Here's your moment. Are you ready? I promise you, He's ready. He's not willing that any should perish. This is the moment. When I say the number three, if you're away from God and you want prayer, just want to look up at me and I'll smile and say thank God. And put your head back down. I'll pray with you right where you sit. Ready? Here it is. Here's the number three. Yeah. Yes, praise God. Praise God. It's worth everything. It's worth everything. It's worth everything. Yeah, it's worth everything. It's worth everything. Praise God. I see it. I see it, man. I see it. I see it. Thank God. I'd like everybody in this church to stand to your feet. And we want to rejoice with the Lord with four people whose hearts are tender before the Holy Spirit that say, I need to be saved. I need a Savior. I need to repent of my sins and make it right. Know that my name is in heaven. So we pray now. We pray now in Jesus' name. We pray now in Jesus' name that you'll help these four individuals understand, repent, believe, and trust only in Jesus Christ for their eternal life. That they'll understand, repent, believe, trust only in Jesus Christ for their eternal life. Even as they pray a simple prayer. Beloved, I'm just going to say a prayer stuttering on purpose, stammering a little bit. Because I want you to fill in the blank and make it your prayer. You can do it out loud. You can do it quietly. Four of you that made eye contact with me that I saw. Say, say to God something like this. You know, if you can talk on the phone, you can talk to God. It's simple. Just talk to Him. Here, here we go. Let's go. Here I am, God. Dear God, here I am. Here I am. And I'm sorry for my thoughts that were wrong. And God, I'm sorry for my words that were wrong. I'm sorry for the things I've done that are wrong. I apologize to you, God. And I, I'm sorry for the things I should have done that I didn't do. Those failures I'm also sorry for. And I confess my sin. But with my mouth today, I confess Jesus is Lord. Church, I want to count to three. I want everybody in this room, from the worship leader to the preacher, to say Jesus is Lord. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. Back to our prayer. With my mouth, I confess Jesus is Lord. With my heart, I believe God has raised Jesus from the dead. I don't understand all this. I don't understand all this, God. But I want all of it. Please forgive me and, and give me the assurance and, and, the, and the spark in my gut that I am a child of yours. That the old is gone. The new has come. I accept you. I receive you and I trust you. And I believe in you. The river of life prays for these four precious people that the roots of growth will go way down deep and find that living water. That tap root will find that tap water. And the fruit of discipleship will go way up high. And not one thing will be stolen from what you've planted in their hearts today. In Jesus' name. Church, you know there's a lot of churches there that will go all year and not see four people give their hearts to Jesus. I think we should give God some praise in this house for the Great job, media. Put that last picture up. We may sing a song or two and pastor will come and dismiss. One of the reasons I want you to pour yourself out Not just your opportunities and your money and your gifts and your talents and your availability to grow the kingdom. But the negative stuff too, the unforgiveness and the anger and all that stuff is because if you pour yourself out, it might have implications for generations. 524 people came to Jesus as Ebenezer Scrooge prayed for him over the last six Decembers. And it's all because of one man 
pouring himself out. As we play this song, if there's something before we dismiss that you need to pour out before the Lord, these altars are open. Maybe, maybe it's your talent. Maybe it's your gift. God, you've been stirring me, but I've just not really done anything with it. I don't know what to do with it, but I pour myself out before you. I give to you my life. Or maybe it's bitterness or unforgiveness or whatever. As we play through this and sing or not sing, whatever the protocol here is, if you've got something that you need to pour out for, don't miss this three or four minutes before the Lord, whatever it is, just to kneel before Him and say, I pour it out like water in a cave. I pour it out in the name of Jesus. The altar's open now if you like to come. The altar's open now. myself to him. No, I'm not perfect, but I give myself to him and, and, and that he can just use me whatever way he will. And if you, we want, to, we want that to happen. We can help you to grow. We've got some things that we can help you put in your hands and things that we can share with you to just help you grow in your, your walk with Christ. Maybe it was a recommitment or it was a first time decision, but whatever it was, just know God doesn't want you to do it alone. 
That's why we have, as part of the church, as part of the body of Christ, that we help one another, we encourage one another, we strengthen one another, we pray for one another. And so, again, we just thank God for what you, what decision you made this morning. What I want to do at this time is receive our offering today, our tithes and offerings, as well as a special love offering for Brother Phillips today, Brother Joe. And man, didn't you just love that ministry this morning? Amen. Wasn't that awesome? Praise God. Praise God. Yeah, you can give the Lord a hand for Brother Joe. Amen. Give the Lord a hand for Brother Joe. What we're going to do, instead of passing the plates, we're going to ask you to come like we normally do when we do a love offering. If you've got regular tithes and offerings, I'm not sure... Is that what you have? Okay. So uh, if you have regular tithes and offerings, please bring those to Brother Ernest on my left and your right. If you have uh, your love offering, you want to bring on behalf of Brother Joe in the ministry because, you know, it's one thing I like to teach you and I hope I have taught you is that you're not just giving money and putting it in the plate. It's like Brother Joe, you're investing. You're investing in the kingdom of God. And you can't outgive God. Brother Joe, I know that to be a fact. And I'll just share one quick testimony. When I was in Bible school, I was down in Southeastern. I went down there with $600 to my name, and that was it. That's all I had. It was just enough to get me into the first semester. I didn't know where the money was going to come from for the rest. And I can remember one day, Brother Joe was at the Carpenter's Home Church. I was there. And I had seven, I think, seven $1 bills in my wallet. And I said, God, this is all I got. Oh, that's not going to pay my, my Southeastern bill. But it was symbolic of what you just said. Well, I, just, I said, Lord, I just give it all to you. And it was like, it's like I just put myself in an offering. And here I am today. God made a way. God, they came up with a scholarship. I think they just made up one for me. And it paid two years of my school. And then I got married and I've been dead ever since. I'm just kidding. <laughs> But I'm, <laughs> but I'm just saying God did it. He did it. He is taking care. And I, you just can't out give God. And so whatever God puts in your heart this morning, just be obedient to Him because you can't. You really cannot out give God. Amen. So Father, this morning we thank You for this ministry. We thank You for this powerful Word. And God, as we pour ourselves out to You, God, Lord, whether it's our time, our talents, our abilities, our finances, God, our love, that it's really Your love. It all belongs to You. And so, Lord, we, we just give ourselves to you, Lord. We just thank you for the blessing of, of Brother Joe and this ministry, God. I ask you, Lord, not just financially help him, Lord God, but Lord, in every way, God, physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, God, in every every way, God, I pray you bless him. Bless his family. God, I know he has to be away from them uh, so much. And Lord, I just pray your blessing uh, on his family, his wife, God. And Lord, just all of his children, God, just all of all of his family, just bless and watch over them. And God, we just thank you for this privilege to give to the most powerful kingdom, God, that there ever will be, the kingdom of God. So Lord, we ask you to Lord, bless these tithes, these offerings, God, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So if we'll come right now again, regular tithes and offerings to Brother Ernest, uh, love offering toward Brother Joe and his ministry, over to Brother Greg. Presentation. It's not going to be trying to beat someone over the head or anything like that. But it's going to have a great time. But also, wouldn't it be just awesome to see them come to the Lord? Amen. They might not come to a church service. They might not come to a youth revival or any kind of a church service. But you just say, you know what? He's just going to come. He's going to share some comedy about 30, 45 minutes. And, hey, you know. And then the Lord can do it. He can just touch their heart. So I encourage you. Please invite folks. Uh, did you want to say anything about your table out there at all at this point? Book about family and a book about transformation and uh, the comedy CD that has no spiritual value at all. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, again, God bless you as 
you go forth today, just remember when I have a group tonight, of course, or drama practice. For those of you who do the three o'clock drama, we're, we're just going to uh, take off today on that. But at six o'clock this evening, please be here. Please bring someone with you. Just invite whoever you can. Amen. Uh, now, now what we're going to do, it's time to open those doors and go back into the world. Amen. But as we go, we go share Jesus. Just like someone who came share Jesus to us. Amen. God bless everybody. Have a great afternoon.